This is part 5 titled Identified, Crucified and Buried in this sermon series on our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ. Be enriched as you listen. We're going to make our declaration now and then we will get into God's word. I uh, just want you wherever you are to hold your bible uh, high up in the air if you're seated you can remain seated just hold your bible high up in the air and let's say this out together it's an affirm- affirmation of what we believe from the word of god and what god has spoken concerning us so let's say this out loud bold and strong together this is god's word this is god speaking to me i am who god says i am i can do what god says i can do I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word, I believe his word, and I live by his word. Christ is my master. and to him i am in absolute surrender i walk in the more glorious covenant with god i live the more glorious life in the spirit or i manifest the glor- more glorious ministry of the spirit in jesus name amen amen thank you for doing the declaration with us i apologize for that little mistake towards the end so we are going to continue our time in the word of god in our study in the word of god on our identity in christ and we are exploring this revelation that is already there in scripture uh, we are just uncovering it unpacking it so to speak little by little over the weeks so that we can understand it and our goal is not just to accumulate knowledge accumulate information that's not our objective our objective is to discover truth that will transform our lives and truth transforms and truth conforms us into the image of god's son the lord jesus christ so, so that's the whole purpose so we began our journey saying that this is a revelation that god uh, gave through his servants that are recorded for us in the new testament primarily apostle paul uh, he wrote much of this uh, in his epistles and he gave it to the church and for us today we are reading it and uncovering this revelation you see god brought us into christ so that we could be like christ so that we could be conformed to that image and be like him and of course it's a journey we make we are being changed from glory to glory but part of that transformation is for us to understand our identity in Christ understand our inheritance in Christ and to learn to live out of what God has done for us in Christ today as we move forward in our study on our identity in Christ we're going to touch upon a very important part of this whole revelation uh, we're going to do it in two parts today and then we'll continue this next sunday You see many of us understand substitution in scripture. We understand substitution which means one for or on behalf of the many. So Christ was our substitute. Christ died for the sins of many and he paid the price for all our sins. And because of what he did we enjoy the blessing of forgiveness and salvation and so on so substitution one on behalf of the many but the scriptures also talk about another aspect of truth which we call as identification identification is many in the one many in the one so that what happened to the one affects the many that's identification and we see this truth brought out for us especially in romans chapter 5 and also in chapter 6 and we're going to spend some time in romans chapter 6 you know 
Paul introduces this truth in Romans 5 when he says, uh, for one, by one man, sin came into this world and death passed upon all, all have sinned. He says in Romans chapter 5, and maybe I'll just read uh, that what I just mentioned Ram, was Romans 5 and verse 12. Uh, we go down to Romans 5 and verse 19. Paul says, for by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So that, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So you'd see the truth of identification there. Many in the one, what happened to the one affected the many. One man, Adam, sinned. All were made sinners. All were brought unto death. What happened to the one affected the many. But the Bible also says, one man, Jesus, referred to as the last Adam, he, by one man, he was obedient and many in him were made righteous. First man was disobedient, was sinful. Many in him became sinful. So identification, many in the one, so that what happened to the one affected the many. The natural man, in the natural, we are identified with Adam. So that what happened to Adam affects all of us. The new creation man is identified in Christ. So that what happened to Christ is extended to the entire new creation. Let me repeat that again. In the natural, the natural man is identified in Adam. So that what happened to Adam affects the entire human race. The new creation is identified in Christ. So that what happened to Christ affects the old New creation. So that is identification. And we're going to look at it in detail in Romans chapter 6. So in the mind of God, we as believers, part of the new creation, were identified in Christ. So that what happened to Christ becomes true in our lives. You say, you know, how does this work? Now, I don't necessarily understand how it works. But we just know it is truth and it does happen. For instance, how could one man's disobedience, Adam, who lived thousands of years before, affect you and me today? But the fact is, it is true. He sinned and we are in that today, in the natural. No human person escapes from that. It's evident. Similarly, we may not be able to explain how 2,000 years ago Christ lived and he did certain things, how come you and I are identified with that? Can't explain it, but it's true. And we need to live, learn to live out of that. It's true because the word of God teaches that for us. So in the mind of God, you and I were identified in Christ so that what happened to Christ is true for you and me today. And we can learn to live out of that. How do we substantiate all of this? And we will do so from Romans chapter 6. But let me just give us a little preview. What Paul brings out for us in Romans 6 is this. That the new creation, which is you and I, we as believers are identified in Christ, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his ascension, and in his exaltation at the right hand of the Father. So when Christ died, you and I died. When Christ was buried, you and I were buried. When Christ was resurrected, you and I were resurrected. When Christ ascended, you and I ascended. When Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father, you and I were seated with him in the heavenly realms. Now, this is the spiritual, not the natural. The natural identifies with Adam, the spiritual new creation, identifies with Christ. Now, this is spiritual truth. So that in the mind of God, we were identified with Christ so that today in time, you and I can actually live out of that truth. That this truth, this spiritual reality 
has its influence in our natural, everyday life. And that's what we must learn and we must understand and learn to live out of. So we're going to touch upon the initial part today. When Christ died, you and I died. When Christ was buried, you and I was buried. What does that mean? And how does that affect our lives practically today? We're going to discover from Romans chapter 6. So let's read Romans chapter 6. I want to just read the whole chapter through one time so that uh, we get an understanding of the context and then we're going to highlight a few things today and then we will continue this next Sunday. But this truth is so important and I want to explain to, I'll explain to us why this is so important. This truth of identification is so important. But let's read Romans chapter 6. It says, what shall we say then? Paul begins with a question. Some of his questions, uh, you know, uh, have an answer right there. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, should we keep on sinning that God will just keep on giving us grace? He answers it right there, verse 2. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He says, we, we don't live like that. We don't keep on sinning so that grace keeps on abounding because he says, look, there's a truth you need to come face. And what is that truth? He says, we have died to sin. So how can you live in it any longer? And we're going to understand what he means by saying, die to sin. He goes to explain. Verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, in the same manner, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, then you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness." For when you are slaves of sin, you are free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and, have, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
I know I've taken the time to read the whole chapter, but this is a very powerful chapter. Now, before we get into the early part of that verse, I want to just look at verses 17 and 18. And I want to help us understand why this truth is so important. See, Paul is writing to the Romans and he says this in verse 17. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now notice he says, you know, you were slaves of sin. But then what did you do? You obeyed from the heart. What did you obey from the heart? The doctrine, the teaching to which you were delivered. And what did that teaching do? It set you free from sin. So this teaching, this form of doctrine, this teaching... Now, that word form of doctrine is very, very interesting. Because that word form, he he's, he's has the idea in the Greek, it has the idea of a dye. You know, when you cast something and you want to you know, create a mold, you have a dye. And if you pour metal into it or you know, whatever thing that will solidify, it's, it forms, it's a mold. And then that mold det determines the outcome. You can pour something into it. And the mold determines the outcome, the form. So doctrine acts like that mold is what Paul is saying. And he's saying, look, you are slaves of sin. You received this doctrine and you obeyed it from your heart. And what happened? This teaching liberated you. It made you free from sin. So this teaching. What Paul is unveiling to us in Romans chapter 6 and then eventually expands it in Romans 8 is that teaching, this form of doctrine, this mold that will transform somebody who's a slave to sin to be somebody who's totally free from sin and walking in righteousness. And, you know, just a little personal testimony. This chapter, Romans 6, 7, and 8 are so special to me because personally, I remember going way back in time in my spiritual journey, uh, in my early teenage years, I, on Saturdays, I would, and this time I was about 13, 14, 15, around that age. I would go to the Methodist church in Bangalore City, Richmond Town, it's still there. And they had the little library there. Where it was just one room with lots of books in it. And there was, they had another hall called Stevens Hall, which had a room at the back. But I would just go and pray. I would spend the whole Saturday there, uh, half the day in prayer and half the day in just studying in the library. And there was a season at that time in those, I was probably about 14 or 15 years. There's a season when my whole question to God was, how do I live a holy life? How do I overcome sin in my life? And how do I live a holy life? That was my big question, the question of holiness. God is holy. He tells us be holy. How do we live holy? How do we overcome sin? And uh, Initially, I thought, you know, maybe there will be a lightning bolt that struck me and that I would have some sort of a great experience. Jesus would appear to me and uh, suddenly I would just become a holy person and all desire for sin would disappear. You know, and then, you know, we would, I would read some stories of people who've had, you know, great personal encounters with Jesus. Maybe they went out away on a hill somewhere and were fasting and praying and, you know, they had this great encounter with God and the presence of God came and they came back as really transformed people, changed people and so on. So I, for initially I thought that was what was going to happen, you know, but none of that happened. Uh, but my search continued, God, what is the answer? And during that time of seeking God, I landed here in Romans chapter 6. Because I came through Romans 5, came through Romans 6, and I said, hey, in this chapter, Paul is teaching us the secret to holiness, to living that life free from sin. And so I remember reading Romans 6, 7, and 8. And you know, the first time I read these chapters, I didn't understand them. But I remember sitting at the table, I had different versions of the Bible in front of me, you know, the Good News Bible, the, you know, whatever versions I could find, they're all there, the King James. And, and I was reading this chapter through in every, trans, every version, 
just wanting to understand and looking up the Greek and trying to understand the meaning of this thing, of what he was saying here. But then when I understood this truth, it set me free. And that's what I want to see happen to each one of us. Here in this chapter 6 and then again in chapter 8, Paul gives us the truth, that, that form of doctrine that takes us from being slaves of sin to being free from sin and set free to walk in holiness. And this teaching, this truth here in Romans 6 is the key. So what is Paul teaching us here in Romans 6? That we want to understand that. What he's telling us this is this. He says, you know, the, the whole issue here is, should we continue in sin that grace would abound? That's verse 1. The answer is certainly not. Obviously, as God's people, we're not going to be living in sin. We're not going to continue in sin. There is grace, but grace doesn't encourage us to sin. Grace encourages, encourages us to walk out of sin and live in holiness. But then how do we do that? So Paul begins to say, I want you to know that you are dead to sin. Verse 2. Don't you know you're dead to sin? Say, Paul, what do you mean I'm dead to sin? He says, listen, I want to tell you something. Verse, verse 3. When you were baptized into Christ, that means you were brought into Christ. You were brought into union with him. So there is a spiritual dimension and the natural. The spiritual is the Holy Spirit baptized us into Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. We read that in the very beginning. The natural is water baptism, which is an outward expression of you and I being baptized into Christ. So he says, you've been baptized into Christ. You are in Christ now. And because you are in Christ, it's verse 3, you are also baptized into his death. Wait a minute. He died 2,000 years ago, or he died during Paul, the time when Paul was writing. It was already, you know, about 25 years or since the time Christ died, a little over that, between 25 and 30 years, Paul was writing this. For you and me reading it today, it's 2,000 years. Christ died in time past. But yet, he's saying, you are baptized into his death. You are identified in his death. How do we understand that? Well, in chapter 5, he has introduced the truth of identification. What did he say? He said, one man was disobedient, and in him, everybody became sinners. That's verse 19. But he also said, one man was obedient, and in him, identified in him, what happened to him happened to us. And that's the truth is expanding here in depth piece by piece. And he's saying, when Christ died, you and I died. Not only that, verse 4, we were buried with him. When Christ was buried, you and I were buried. That's verse 4. But not only that, verse continuing verse 4, as he was raised from the dead, you and I were also raised to walk in newness of life. Verse 5, we've been united in his death. And so also we are united in his resurrection. So in first five verses, he's saying, you know, here's the key for not continuing in sin, living in grace, but not living in sin. Here's the key. Understand that we are identified with Christ. We are identified with him in his death, in his burial, his resurrection. Identified. So, but what does that mean? I'm identified with him in his death. He begins to explain in verse six going to spend some time in that, knowing this. So every believer needs to know this. And today, if you are listening, you need to know this. Know what? That our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we no longer should be slaves of Sin. Romans 6, verse 6, is that powerful verse. What's he saying? I want you to know that your old man, what is the old man? It's that part of us that came through Adam. In Adam, we had that sinful nature, Adam's nature, the old man, the, the, the thing that propelled us to sin. He says, I want you to know that your old man was crucified with Christ. So when Christ died, the old man was crucified with him. The old man died. To be crucified means to be put to death. The old man was crucified. 
What was the result? The body of sin was done away with. The body of sin was cast out. The body of sin was rendered inoperative. No more effect on you. What is the body of sin? That whole a part of you that wanted to sin, that kept you in control to sin. So I remember way back as early in my teenage years, as I sat down and I read this and read this, and I said, wow, this is powerful. That means I don't have a sinful nature anymore. I don't have Adam's nature because that was crucified. And the body of sin, that is the power of sin over my life, was rendered inoperative. Sin has no more power over me. It says that in verse 6. And he repeats that in verse 14. We will look at that. But this is the truth of identification you and I must understand. That the old man was crucified with Jesus. So that the body of sin, the power of sin over our lives must be broken. And what is the result? So that we should no longer be slaves of sin. You are no longer a slave of sin. Romans 6, 6. See, this is where when we don't know the truth, the devil lies to us. The devil lies to you and says, you know, there's a way you're born. You've got to live like this. Or, well, you've been doing this for 25 years. You're going to do this for the rest of your life. He's going to tell you lies. But I want you to know the truth. The truth says, your old man was crucified. The power of sin over your life was broken. You don't any longer need to be a slave of sin. Because he says there in verse 7, he who has died has been free from sin. He who's dead is free from sin. Now think about this. You know, uh, just think about a, a man who was, who was a drunkard. You know, he was a drunk, a drunkard all his life. And let's say he dies. Now you can put around him all the alcohol bottles, whatever, his favorite drinks. Even his little finger will not move because he's dead. He who's dead is free from sin. And that's who you are. That's who I am in Christ. Now, this is the truth of identification, meaning God says, I've done this for you. I want you to know it. That's why he begins verse 6 says, knowing this, you need to know it. And then you need to accept this word as true and then live according to it. So today, know this truth. The power of sin over your life has been broken and you no longer are a slave to any sin. Now, some of you listening, there may be things in your life that you've been tolerating. Or there may be things in your life that you've accepted and said, look, I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life. I was born like this or I grew up like this or whatever. There are so many excuses. But today, the truth is there. You are no longer a slave to sin because the old man was crucified, the power of sin over your life was broken. When Christ died, you died. The body of sin was crucified with him, was destroyed there on the cross. And you are dead. And so you can live free from sin. Now, the other thing he says is we are buried with him. What happens when someone is buried? Burial, you know, you imagine a person dead. That means they have left one realm and moved on to the other. They've left this earthly realm, stepped into the next. They are dead. And he says, we have been buried with him. When Christ was buried, you were buried. That means the old, you left the old, you stepped into the new. You, the old has no more claim over your life. When a person is dead, earth has no claim on him. Gone. Everything about the earth, earth life is gone. Yeah, that person could have had huge debt. When he's dead, it doesn't affect him anymore. That person could, you know, whatever in the, in, in the earth realm, doesn't affect him anymore. He's dead. He's buried. Gone. And that's what happened to you and me. When Christ was buried, we were buried. He says in verse 4 there, we were buried with him, meaning the old is gone. It has no more claim over you. So I want to wrap this up very quickly. What does Paul tell us to do? In the light of this, we are going to come back to Romans 6 next Sunday and explore the rest of it. But what does he tell us to do? He tells us three things. He tells us to know this. That's in verse 6, Romans 6, 6. He says, know this. Then in verse 11, he says, I want you to reckon 
yourselves dead. That means I want you to count this as fact. To reckon means to count it as a fact, to count it as a truth. So reckon yourself to be dead. And the third thing he tells us is in, in verse, uh, verse 13, he actually repeats it several times. He says, yield, the King James says, yield, or he says, present your members. Yield yourself to this truth. So know this truth, count this truth, count this as truth, reckon it, and yield yourself to it and say, God, I'm going to live on the basis of this truth. So what do you and I say? If we say in verse 14, he says, sin will not have dominion over you. What, what can you and I say? We call what God has done as true in our lives. We say, sin will not have dominion over me. And you can look at every sinful thing in your life. Maybe there are addictions. Maybe there are things that are holding you. Maybe for decades they've been in your life. But today you look at that and you say, that sin, you will not have dominion over me. You do not have any place in me because according to the scriptures, your power over my life was broken. Sin will not have dominion over me. I know this truth. I accept it as a fact. I yield myself to this truth. That that sin, I refuse to yield my members as a slave to that sin. I don't need to and I refuse to do it. But instead, I yield my members, my body, as an instrument of righteousness. Because that is truth. There may be things from your past life that are still haunting you today. You say, no, I'm buried with him. Meaning, I'm free from the past. The old is gone. All things have become new. All things are from God. I'm buried with him. The old is gone. Next Sunday, we're going to pick this up. We're going to continue this further. But today... I want this day to be a day of deliverance for you. Just as when I understood this truth, it was a great deliverance for me. I could look at any sin in my life and say, it will no longer have dominion over me. My life, my whole being is an instrument of righteousness. That's truth. And I'm going to walk in it. And that's what I want you to do. You've heard the truth. Today, you can rise up. Call as truth in your life what God has said is true about you. We're going to let the worship team lead us uh, in a few moments of worship. We're going to come back and we're going to pray this word in our lives and say, God, this is truth. I believe it. I embrace it. And if you need to, I want to encourage you to read Romans 6 several times until it just settles in your heart. Then read Romans 8. Paul tells us how to walk in the Spirit which will enable us to walk in this truth. We'll be back right after this time of worship.
We're going to take a moment to pray together based on what we've just heard from Romans chapter 6. We are identified with Christ. What happened to Christ bears consequence to you. When Christ died, you died. When Christ was buried, you were buried. You died so that the power of sin over your life is broken. You were buried. Your old life has ended. It's gone. There's no more claim over you. Nothing of the old has any claim over you. You die. You were buried. Everything is over. Now, today, let's walk in this truth. Know it, count it as a fact, reckon it, yield to it. Know it, reckon it to be true, yield to it. So let's do that. Let's pray together. And I want you to pray with all your heart. This form of doctrine will take you from being a slave to being free from the power and dominion of sin. This teaching transforms, is what Paul wrote there in Romans chapter 6. And so let's Embrace the teaching. Obey from the heart this form of doctrine. It will transform our lives. Let's obey from the heart. Let's do that right now. Father, we have heard your words and we want to obey from our hearts, receive with our hearts and surrender to the truth we have heard. Father, your word says that our old, the old man was crucified with Christ so that the body of sin might be destroyed so that we no longer should be slaves of sin because he who is dead is free from sin. And your word says sin will not have dominion over you. Father, I pray right now for any person watching, listening, God, who feels bound to any form of sin, sinful pattern, anything that's wrong, anything that's unclean, anything that's unpleasant, displeasing in your eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, let this truth set them free. By the power of your Holy Spirit, I declare every bondage over their life broken. I declare every uh, stronghold over their minds and their bodies broken. And let this truth transform them and enable them to walk free from sin. We declare your word that sin will not have dominion over us. We are not under law, we are under grace. We are under that realm where God empowers us to walk victorious over sin. Lord God, let your truth set your people free. Even today, we receive your truth. We count it to be true and we yield ourselves to it. We yield our members as instruments of righteousness. And Father, thank you that you enable each one of us to walk in holiness, just as it says there in Romans 6, that we have a fruit of holiness in our lives because we receive this truth. Thank you, Father. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. Let there be great deliverances, great healings, great miracles in the lives of your people as they listen right now. Let the power of God touch lives. Let the power of God impact lives bringing about transformation in people. We thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for being with us on the service today. We look forward to you joining us again next Sunday. We're going to continue this delve deeper in Romans 6 and look at the, uh, this whole truth on identification. Take some time to think about it. Study on it further from the scriptures, uh, it, and it is really amazing. Until next time, God bless you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, publication, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcbiblecollege.org. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play Store.